Hello everyone, welcome again. Uh, this lecture is on chapter 24, The Origin of Species, dealing with Darwin and his understanding of the means of natural selection. So the biological species concept emphasizes reproductive isolation. And with this concept, we now can define what biological species are, which is a group of populations whose individuals may interbreed and produce viable fertile offspring with each other, but not with members of other species. So that, therefore, speciation itself is an evolutionary process in which one species splits into two or more species. And with humans, we see that we are all one species. Therefore, we are able to reproduce with multiple species in different regions. So therefore, within humans, speciation happens less likely in the evolutionary process in which all our genes are have very um, have a lot of variation among species. But within reproductive isolation, we can see that the speciation um, then has this other biological factor or barriers that exist uh, that impede members of two species from producing viable fertile offspring. But we do know that there's a hybrid in which offspring that result from the mating of individuals from two different species or from two from true breeding of varieties of the same species. So within the species, we know that polar bears and grizzly bears shown here are able to mate and create a hybrid and the hybrid being the growler bear. Uh, the growler bear is a hybridization of this reproductive isolation that occurs between species. Within this mechanism, we also have the postzygotic barriers, which is a reproductive barrier that prevents hybrid zygotes produced by two different species from developing into viable fertile adults. And this concept includes three different um, underpinnings, right? We know that impeding members of different species from attempting to mate is a part of this postzygotic barrier, preventing an attempted mating from being completed successfully or hindering fertilization if mating is completely successful. So there's different um, topics like this in natural in the natural environment where we know that habitat isolation occurs, temporal isolation, behavioral isolation, and mechanical isolation are just four of the few different ways of prezygotic barriers that occur within natural organisms. An example of these are the fruit fly in which they are habitat isolation depending on the different season on which they're able to find the fruits in which they are able to lay their eggs. We also see that there's a difference in the time of day, a season or difference in years in which gametes can mix, um, as in the skunk. And then within the blue-footed booby here, we have there are inhabitants of the Galapagos. Um, they mate only after courtship display uh, with the unique, um, that is unique to the species. So after the courtship display, there's behavioral isolation that occurs if you're not able to um, have this extravagant type of behavioral um, display for the female to then choose you to then create this uh, create your offspring. So that is a part, part of reproductive isolation in itself behaviorally. We also have uh, mechanical um, dealing with the mating attempt of the different snails. We know that different morphologies depending on the different areas, the morphology of the gametes are, are different when it comes to the actual sex organs themselves and being able to mechanically reproduce with the female is not able to be done depending on the species of snail. So other definitions of species. We know that morphological species concept is a species in terms of measurable anatomical criteria. Scientists often distinguish species using morphological criteria looking at different um, wing length, arm length, and things like that, scientists are able to differentiate different species based off of that, not only just the reproductive. An ecological species concept is a species ecological niche. And this is the sum of how members of the species interact with non-living and living parts of their environment. Uh, and this concept can accommodate asexual as well as sexual species. So I put this little diagram here of the ecosystem up here. Because as an individual, we know that you can have different mutations, but then you don't have a major adaptation or evolution that occurs until the population. 
And within this population, you have these different um, mechanisms that go from the individual to the biosphere. And within this, we have the ecological species concept in which within the different environments, different species are able to um, procreate depending on the different species themselves and the environment that they live in. So let's go further into speciation and how it can take place with or without geographical separation. So we know allopatric speciation is a definition for gene flow that is interrupted when a population is divided into geographical isolated subpopulations. So if you see the diagram above with the Drosophila melanogaster, we can see that an initial sample of fruit flies is here, and we took this population and separated them. So these two populations are the same, but with different diets. So now we have starch medium compared to the maltose medium. And these two different mediums allow us to see this allopatric speciation that occurs when different diets are given to the organisms. So after several generations, we have been feeding starch medium to these Drosophila or these fruit flies. And then from here, you can see the same with the maltose fed ones. And this is a form of what we call it, the reproductive isolation that occurs within allopatric speciation in which after releasing these two different species together, they are still able to speciate and there's a mating preference that occurs amongst the different Drosophila. The process of allopatric speciation is very important when it comes to understanding sympatric speciation. So sympatric is from the Greek, the Greek sin or together or a synonym with the speciation that occurs in populations that live in the same geographical area. So here we have one large population. As the water falls and the tide falls, we see that allopatric speciation happen, happens as a population forms a new species while geographically isolated from its parent population. The same can be said with sympatric speciation as a subset of a population forms a new species without geographical separation. So because of the change in the water, we see that this begins with the drop in the water level with the species, uh, species that grows on its own population. And as the water level increases, sympatric speciation occurs where that same different population is able to now repopulate with the larger population and creating this new species and a changing of a little frequency. So we have evidence of allopatric speciation which occurs from this area here in the Isthmus of Panama, where we have the different um, crawfish and their species that occur on different size, sides of the Isthmus. But they are still able to procreate, being the same species, but having different claws. So depending on where the crawfish lives, they'd have specific morphological characteristics that allows them to be um, allopatrically speciated but are the same species of organism. Planning are defined polyploidy, which is a chromosomal alteration in which the organism possesses more than two complete chromosome sets, which is common in plants, right? We know that plants have this weird way of um, exchanging genes and different genetics due to their, um, their actual life cycles. So we also wanna define the autoploid or autoploidy which is a fertile individual that has more than two different species interbreeding and combining their chrom chromosomes. And the same can, said, can be said with alloploidy or alloploid, which is a fertile individual that has more than two different chromosomes sets as a result of two different species interbreeding and combining their chromosomes. So the difference between the two would be a form of the species um, interbreeding and specifically the chromosomes at the allopatric level. So to define these two, I kind of put the image here to show the differences between the two. We know that this is a form of an error that kind of occurs um, from cell division within the diploid cell that then turns into a tetraploid cell, which has basically four sets of chromosomes, the four in here, that then tries to divide. And now you have a, a, a meiosis, you have two in, in both of these cells. And then the cell from, <clears throat> a cell arises uh, from an, uh, to a new species with these four different chromosomes, which is a form of autopolyploidy. We can see the same with allo 
allopolyploidy in the sense of this diploid cell with the 6N. But then we also see that there are two different species with two different sets of chromosomes shown here. And as they mate, the normal gametes and the normal gamete from the different species come together, they be create this sterile hybrid in the zygote, right? So you get this N of five. And at the end of the mitotic or meiosis error in this hybrid, you then see the diplo uh, diploid cell into the new species that is viable and has a fertile hybrid due to this 2N that equals 10. So these different chromosomes that come together within the two different species um, is the difference that you see within autoploidy within um, the autoploidy within the cell division error that happens um, before meiosis. Now sexual selection and habitat differentiation allows us to go further into our understanding of species concepts with the um, ragolotus or the fruit fly, um, a different form of fruit, fruit fly. Uh, we see the hawthorn um, raised fruit and the apple raised uh, fruit fly come from the same species but because they are able to hybridize on different fruits, you can see that there are different speciations that occur based off of the different, um, the different food source or the environmental food source. So hybrids are viable and fertile. And we see that there is no post-zygotic barriers that occurs between the hawthorn raised fly and the apple raised fly. So this whole shift does not affect sexual selection, but it does have a differentiation in the habitat source for uh, food resources. We can also see that hybrid zones reveal factors that cause reproductive isolation. Within a, um, a hybridization, we see the hybrid zones occur. And this is a region which members of different species meet and mate, producing at least some offspring of mixed ancestry. Therefore, we can infer that there is an obstacle to gene flow otherwise alleles from one parent species would also be common in gene in the gene pool of the other parent species. So to drive this idea home, we have hybridized zones, and through time we can see that there are different spe specifics that happen between the hybridized zones. And these different alleles from the parent species are in the same gene pool of the other species, causing this hybridization. And to go further into gradual speciation, we can see that there's a founder species that then splits and diverges into these two separate species. And as these species continue to mate with one another based off of the environmental factors through time, we can see that at the end of the day, they speciate into gradual speciation through this gradual process of evolution. But then we see on the other end of the punctuated equilibrium, where there's a founder species that occurs that diverges into two, but then there's something that happens evolutionarily in the environment that makes this change punctual or faster and not as drawn out in time as it would be in the gradual speciation. So patterns within the hybrid zones show us that hybrid zones typically are located wherever the habitats of the interbreeding species meet. So in between the two populations, you would see that the hybridized zone would be between the two populations here or in the red line that's shown and occurs where the habitats of the two species meet. Within here, you can then zoom in and see that there are uh, fire-bellied toad range is on this side, and the yellow-bellied toad range is on the left side on the other side at the bottom here. And between the two is the hybridizing zone where the two populations meet, and they're able to then populate within this hybridizing zone, creating hybrids. And these hybrids themselves are based off of the frequency of these frogs and their alleles to the distance from the hybridized zone center in which we can see that there is a trajectory that occurs between populations that meets right here in the hybridized zone, allowing for these two populations to not only hybridize, but then those populations to then bounce back and forth across the zone in this interbreeding species process. Hybridized zones and environmental change occurs all the time due to environment, uh, environmental pressures. A hybrid zone can be a source of novel genetic variation that improves the ability of one or both parent species to cope with changing environmental conditions. So as the environment changes, 
three populations of a species are connected by a gene flow. So this um, concept here is nice when it comes to understanding the population and the gene flow itself within that population and how that continues on to until a barrier occurs. So a barrier to the gene flow is established causing the regular population to continue on its own um, trajectory but then the barrier to the gene flow allows part of that population to then continue in the other direction and diverge. It's kind of like our idea in the phylogeny. This population begins to diverge from the other two populations and continues on until the gene flow is reestablished in a hybrid zone. In this hybrid zone here are hybrid in individuals created from the barrier that occurred that then allows for the original population or the founder population to then mate with the hybrid population or the separate population. So the reinforcement, um, which I talked about briefly in the last slide, is strengthening the reproductive barriers. So in such cases, natural selection should strengthen prezotic barriers to pre-production, reducing the formation of unfit hybrids. Because this process involves reinforcing reproductive barriers, it is called reinforcement. And with this reinforcement, the hybrids themselves are that are not able to compete with the other population and mates and continue their those on to the next generation are then um, unfit and found to be um, taken out of the population through natural selection. And the same could be said within our actual fish that we see um, in nature from Pundamilia nariria and Pundamilia Pundamiliae and the Pundamilia, the turbid water, which is the hybrid of offspring from a location within turbid water. So these two species have different uh, populations that then created a hybrid based off of the environmental pressure of turbid water. Within this, we now have the idea of stability, and this is continued formation of hybrid individuals, where these hybrid individuals continue, and many hybrid zones are stable in the sense that hybrids continue to be produced, we know hybrids survive or reproduce better than members of either parent species, at least in certain habitats or years. And stable hybrid zones have also been observed in cases where the hybrids are selected against an unexpected result. So therefore, when you're talking about stable um, environments, you know that there's different populations that overlap. And as um, the stability occurs, we know that continued formation of these hybrid individuals occurs between the populations. And the same can be said here with the females and compared to the males. The hybrid frogs here are really just based off of morph morphological differences, right? So we see that there is a uh, more, more pointy part of the um, nose or snout here with the normal basis of the um, snout within these Eurostatal frogs. In general, um, the western buffalo has a lot of different speciation that occurs, right? We see the eastern, western, and the bispinosis that occurs here and that continues this hybridization of this spinosis based off of snout urostatal length for clarification. Speciation can occur rapidly or slowly and can result from change in few or more or many genes. So as I said before, punctuated, um, the punctuated model or punctuated equilibria is used to describe these periods of apparent stasis or punctuated by sudden change. So this evolution occurs suddenly, as shown in the previous slide, in which you have a founder population that then diverges very punctual or very quickly that arises through time without having it to be gap gradual. So going to the temp of the speciation gradual model, we know that the gradual model allows for us to see this gradual transition of speciation that occurs as the punctual is totally different, right? So the other species do not show a punctuated pattern. Instead, they appear to have changed more gradually over time. And within these different speciation things, we know that speciation rates um, change and occur within environments based off of the environmental pressures. So researchers have identified particular genes involved in some cases of speciation. We know speciation can be driven by few or more genes. 
and new species can form rapidly once divergence begins, but it can take millions of years for that to happen, going back to our punctuated model and then our gradual model. The time interval between speciation events varies considerably from a few thousand years to tens of millions of years. And to use uh, one of our uh, classic examples is we're going to check out the flower. And there's different flowers and different flower species, but within this one we see the typical Mimulus lewisii here shown in A. Well, this is the typical flower which you will find as a founder flower. And if you go to B, you will find that uh, Mimulus lewisii with an M cardinalis flower color allele. So as different flowers within the species um, mates with other flower colors in their alleles, you see that this new flower color then arises. And the same can be said when we're talking about the M. cardinalis with an M. Lewis flower color allele, in which the mating occurred between the two species that then created uh, this different flower color that is an intermediate between the two. And going um, last but not least to this further corner, uh, we see a typical Mimulus cardinalis that was mated with the others to create these different hybrid flowers that we see here. So speciation rates and hybridization within the different flowers are dealing with plants and we see a lot of the different um, sympatric speciation that occurs.